Hey guys, here are my top books of May, which turned out to be a decent reading month actually, and I'm gonna go through these recommendations in no particular order. So the first book to talk about made me think of a video Kate Armstrong made recently on her, her book crushes that she's had on authors over the years and her current fixation on Deborah Levy's work. I have the feeling that I'm in the beginning stages of a book crush myself, you know, when you read an author for the first time and just get the sense that it's the beginning of a long-term relationship. I got that sense with Susan Sontag from reading Regarding the Pain of Others. And this is a little Picador pocket edition, but the, the print size is normal. And this was a gift from Steve Donahue. In 1977, Sontag wrote an extended essay called On Photography, which I've since ordered. This was published in 2003 and continues a lot of those conversations that she started decades earlier, but it's fine to read as a standalone. So her fundamental questions are, how have images of suffering been perceived culturally? What is their purpose? And do these images actually get us closer to understanding suffering? So she presents all these assumptions we make about photographs in particular, and then interrogates them. And one way she does this is by taking you through the history of war photography, showing how so many iconic moments were actually staged and then questioning why we care that they were. I'm only gonna bring up three points that she addresses to give you some flavor of the book because I could go on and on. I underlined the bejesus out of this book. At one point, she talks about how the more foreign somebody is in comparison to, to the target audience, the more likely it is that that person's face will be captured in a photograph. Whereas when the person looks like you, whoever you is intended to be, people are more likely to think it's in poor taste to capture, you know, that dead or suffering face. She says, for the other, even when not an enemy, is regarded only as someone to be seen, not someone like us who also sees. Later, she brings up this exhibit that a photojournalist put on in Sarajevo in 1994 during the ongoing war in the Balkans, and how this exhibit had uh, images of two harrowing conflicts. One was the siege of Sarajevo, and the other was this conflict in Somalia, and the Bosnians who went to the exhibit were offended that the Somalians were included. She says, to set their sufferings alongside the sufferings of another people was to compare them, which hell was worse, demoting Sarajevo's martyrdom to a mere instance. It is intolerable to have one's own sufferings twinned with anybody else's. Near the end, she probes the idea of, of collective memory, and we all think that there's great importance to collective memory. And she says that photographs don't actually help us understand situations. That's what narratives are for. The purpose of photographs is to haunt us, which has its place, she argues, but ultimately concludes, perhaps too much value is assigned to memory, not enough to thinking. Which I've been thinking about ever since I read it, you know, how we assume that you know, shock makes us think deeply, but often that's not the case. And maybe learning about a conflict isn't as memorable as seeing a terrifying photograph from it, but maybe it's more meaningful. Like with any great writer, it's not just what Sontag says, it's how she says it. You know, her rhetorical strategies are, are just as interesting as the arguments that she's making. Now I did have to concentrate to process this. She sometimes says these, these very long winding sentences, but overall her voice is razor sharp. I, I highly recommend this. Even if you don't come away, convinced with what she's saying. It's quality food for thought. Next are the two books I read from the Women's Prize in May that I most recommend, which are The Idiot by Elif Bottomen and The Ministry of Utmost Happiness by Arundhati Roy. As I talked about in my individual reviews of these, I think they'll both appeal to a relatively small subset of readers, but those subsets will really appreciate them. So head over to those reviews if you're curious to hear more. Fourth Dimension was my first post-prize book, Almost Love by Louise O'Neill. This novel follows an Irish woman named Sarah in her early 20s, as she has this affair with a man who's much older than she is. I think he's a few decades older. And he is clear throughout the affair that he has no interest in her beyond meeting in a cheap hotel room whenever he's in the mood. And the story's about how Sarah becomes 
obsessed with earning his interest and loses her self-respect entirely. It's a portrait of self-destruction and, and difficult to read in that sense. There are personal factors that make Sarah vulnerable to this kind of situation. There's her stalled career, her fixation on money and status, her parents' rocky relationship growing up, and her mother's early death. But there, there's no exact combination of factors that you can point to and be like, oh, that's why she sacrifices her self-esteem and the respect of all the people who love her for this man who doesn't care whether she lives or dies. And Sarah's somewhat aware throughout that her behavior is insane, but she can't stop. The saving grace for a lot of readers, I think, is her friends who, who try to snap her out of this and, and voice what a lot of readers will be thinking, which in itself is interesting because it indicates that Sarah can't have always been like this. Otherwise, she, she never would have had these no-nonsense, loyal friends in the first place. She's come undone, but you only see the shadow of the person that her friends knew. It's written cleanly, I raced through it, and what struck me most were moments when Sarah creates conflict in conversations where it's not necessary, and this happens a lot with her father especially. I thought O'Neill was so insightful at showing how easy it can be to make life harder than it needs to be, and then to make terrible decisions, even knowing in the moment that they're terrible. So if you have a problem with unlikable characters, or if it frustrates you when characters make poor choices, steer well clear of this one. And there are also moments when Sarah makes feminist observations in a way that, that's jarring. Sometimes they come across quite naturally, but Occasionally she expresses something so perfectly that it seems more like a feminist columnist who's thought about these issues extensively making a point than a character casually reflecting on her life. But you know, overall I, I really recommend this. I thought it was raw and emotionally draining and brilliant in places. Lastly, I finished the Tony Man trilogy by reading Fool's Fate by Robin Hobb. My non-spoilery take on the first three trilogies in the Realm of the Elderling series will be popping up in your feeds sometime in the coming weeks. I <laughs> was like a crockpot of emotions going through this one. What Hop does in this trilogy in particular is so special. It goes beyond her plots and her characters and world building, which themselves are great, um, because she's really exploring first person narration, its benefits and its limitations in, in a way that's profound. My brain was lighting up all over the place reading this, you know, and my heart too, I guess. You know, that that cold, barren thing that rouses itself occasionally. So there are my May picks, and you can tell that it was a better reading month because there are five instead of three. And June has already been good to me, so I look forward to checking back in with you guys in a month. Bye. Thanks for watching.